This sacrifice and consume in the flame of oh, this living sacrifice, Lord. Sacrifice and consume in the flame. Only for you, 
Oh, this altar only for you. Only for you. Oh, this altar only for you. Oh, only for you. Only for you, Lord. Only for you. Only for you. We built the altar. Lord, I built this altar for you. Lord, I built this altar. Oh, I built this altar for you. Lord, I built this altar for you. As a memorial for you, lest I forget all you've done for me. Just like you had the children of Israel do at the crossing of the Red Sea, that you had Jacob do. That you had Abraham do. Oh, I built this altar for you. Lord, I built this altar for you. Lord, I built this altar for you. Consume it now. Lord, I built this altar for you. Oh, I built this altar for you. Built this altar for you. Sin your fire now. Oh, sin your fire now. Oh, Lord, sin your fire. Oh, consuming fire. Consume every part of this altar. Oh, consume, consume every part of this all to God. This living sacrifice for you, holy and acceptable, only by you and by your blood. Consuming fire, consuming fire, consuming fire, consuming fire. Burn brighter, burn brighter in us, oh Lord. We give you freedom to send your fire. But we know everything must be in order. We know you will only answer perfect order. With the altar that's exactly like you determined it to be. Only like you described it to be. Here's this altar. Here's this altar, Lord. Here's this altar. Here's his altar for you, my king. Here's his altar. Here's his altar. Send your fire. Send your fire. Consume it all. Consume it all, consume every part of it, consume every part of it.
exalt his name forever. Yes, we magnify you, Lord. We magnify you, Lord. We adore you. We adore you. We magnify you, Lord. We magnify you, Lord. And we adore you. We magnify you, Lord. We magnify you, Lord. We adore you. Yes, we
Welcome everyone tonight. How sacred your presence to us, O oh Lord. The most sacred thing to us, God. That you've given us access into the heavenly realm. That you've given us access into your sanctuary. That you've allowed us to build the altar. To build the altar aright. Not a broken down one, or one that's messed up or looks anything other than perfect. The perfect sacrifice, the perfect living sacrifice for you, Lord Jesus. The perfect sacrifice for you, Father, that you can send your fire. And that the sweet smell of incense the sweet smell of praise and prayer comes forth out of it. Welcome everyone tonight. You may be seated. Don't know exactly where we're going to go. But before the meeting, I was stirred by, uh, keep playing please. I was stirred by Genesis 12 and remembering how God called Abraham. So let's start with Genesis 12, and I believe what this message is going to be about is to build the altar. To build the altar. That the perfect sacrifice paid the highest price to make us to where we could be, perfect altars. That we can be altars, altars of God. The living sacrifices, which is our reasonable service. So let's go to Genesis chapter 12. Now the Lord said unto Abraham, Get out of your country and from your kindred and from your father's house into a land that I will show you. Now in building the altar, you will hear the Lord say, get out of your country. Come out from among them. Come out from the world that surrounds you. Come out and be separate, says God, and I will receive you. Come out from the kindred. Come out from the things that you have known. Come out from the familiar. Come out from that which you have seen and know after a temporal, natural existence and come into the land that I will show you. Come into your promise. Come into the place that I have purchased and possessed, caused you to possess. The high places of the Lord. The place of victory. The place where the high praises of God will be on your mouth and the sharp two-edged sword of the word of the Lord upon your lips. That word that destroys and vanquishes everything of darkness, that vanquishes everything of hindrance, that removes every obstacle. That word that you can wholly trust in for it is sure, it is life, it is living, and it endures forever. Unshakable, unmovable, a firm foundation in which you can have all your expectation for it's true and sure and will never fail but will always endure for it is the word of the lord the word of the lord the word of the lord as we were singing and exhorting you earlier in days of old the people of the Lord, the prophets, would have to arise, or they'd have to say, Arise, arise, O oh God, awake, awake. Utter your voice before your army. But now, because of what Christ Jesus did for us, and this new covenant of life, the Lord says, I want you to awake, awake. I want you to arise, arise. 
on my behalf. Be the people that move on my behalf. Oh, I pray, saints, that it stirs you so deep that you hear it. Because if you don't, it's going to be, you know, we, we can wait on something forever. I was getting the school of worship. I was, last night I was given the example of, you know, driving a car. And if we don't just begin to take that journey, even if we don't know where we're going, we don't start the car and get moving down the road, the car's not going to go anywhere, at least if we get moving. And we allow in our movement the leading of the Holy Ghost, we'll know, okay, turn here, turn there, and we're going to get to the destination of the journey, that point that we're supposed to reach, right? So I'm telling you and encouraging you saints, this is just, it's so amazing. Let us not just, you know, pray prayers of, <laughs> awake, awake, oh God. I mean, that's good, that's good, but he's saying, I want you to awake. I want you to rise. I want you to go. I want to use your mouth. I want to use your feet. Oh, how beautiful the the, oh, how beautiful the shoes. Ha. How beautiful it is upon the mountains, those that bring good news. Oh, the gospel. Ha. Oh, the gospel, the freeing life of liberation. No longer to be in bondage to stagnation and the things that would hinder or keep us from flowing into the realm of the almighty, eternal, supernatural. Oh, as we were singing the night, he's the God of miracles and he's purposed to work the miracles in you. He's purposed to make the, the impossible possible. The impossible possible. May we grab a hold of faith. May we grab a hold of faith in the believing for the impossible. For faith is in action. For without works, without action. Faith is dead, it's dormant, it has no expression, right? So it's that moving, it's that moving. I mean, this hit me so hard the other night when Pastor Mark, he, he said this, and we are so blessed about the, not only the authority and command of the word, but just the, the word of the Lord that goes forth. I mean, come on, it's just amazing. That Pastor Mark said, it's, it's doubt and unbelief for us to pray a prayer of awake, awake, arise, arise. Because God looks at us and he says, you awake, you arise. You go for me. You know, he says, who will go for me? He looks around, who will go for me? And may we say, Lord, I will go for you. I will move. Or else, you know, it's just going to be the same, same old, same old, right? Time flies. It's the truth. This, this life as James says, it's but a vapor. It's vanishing. I want you guys, and we do this with the, with the youth, I want you to begin to set goals by the Spirit. Do you look the same that you did five years ago? I have a thing that's really simple, and this is not the Word of God, but I like to do this. And that's every four years, I, I, I do it with the Olympics because it's a good way to remember, right? Five-year plans, ten-year plans, thirty-year plans, those are all important, and do them. But for me, it's an easy measurable where I never forget, oh, the Olympics is coming up. What is my growth? What is the measure of my movement in God? Because if we don't, we're going to be the same. We're going to be the same, and then we're going to be countless nobodies. And that's very frightening to me. Again, we've heard it before, to go into the halls of heaven. <laughs> and the saints of God say, man, you were resourced with so much. And praise God for his love and grace. He, he, he let a, he'll let us in like dear little swaddling babes wrapped in a manger, right? Oh, but the purpose. Oh, this time, this hour that we live, that you could see the Enochs and the Elijahs and the, the Gabriels and the Michaels saying, you know, just put me in, God. Put me in. Put me in. Right? I mean, Enoch and Elijah, they never die. So they, they've got to die sometime. And we know there's a, there's a purpose and a plan. But for the sake of just, you know, giving you an allegory here of, of it, about the saints, the host of heaven looking at us and saying, wow. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> 
And I'm preaching just as much to me as I am to you. Because I know what? The Father honors truth. Yeah. And I will not be caught dead up here speaking on the Father's behalf, unwilling to do that which He tells me to. So I pray that the stirring of God awake you and awaken the, the, the banner has been lifted, the, the alarm has been sound to go forth and go out like we never have before and effectiveness. And God, I, goodness gracious people, let me encourage you. Let me encourage you and remind you. I mean, maybe just put, I like to be practical. I like to be simple with things and set reminders. If, if some of you need to, put a reminder in your calendar, whatever, if it's Google Calendar, if it's Apple ca uh, Calendar, whatever they call it. On Sunday morning, you put a reminder in there and say, I better be flowing in the Holy Ghost because the lost is coming in this place. And I will be accountable for what happens in my testimony. We had several people come in here that were not saved this morning, that I was reaching to God for. And God help us. If we be such little babies in a nursery, that we got to come in just to be filled up. And I know this isn't light preaching, but I hope it stirs you up. May we never be so pathetic that we have to, that we're, it's like we're as the lost, right? Because God has purposed us, and I know many of you are in this, and then you just need to be reminded of it, to be in it. Be in it every time, but especially I plead with you on Sunday morning. We're, what we're going after is we're going after seeing lives changed and touched. And we know it will not be by religion. It will be by the miracle, miraculous power of a God who manifests himself through us. And oh, as we bring forth the praise and that glory just fills the place because he has a perfect sacrifice where he can come in and move. That's what we want. That's what we want. And I praise God for the things that happened this morning. But I could see some of you, and I'm just being real. I like to be real. I like to be honest. Who wants to play pretend? I don't. I've never been that way. Just call it for what it is. Let the righteous smite me. You know, no matter what. So that truth might be found, right? I would ask you this question in general. So that it might prompt you to hunger. And God forbid that you never get offended, but it prompts hunger. It prompts desperation. Desperation. And that is, were you one of the ones engaged in this morning for the fight of souls? For the battle that rages on by what are formidable foes of hell. But, praise God, that even the smallest child among us, my Anna and Naomi, having taken hold of the word of God, and the word of the Lord can put to flight the armies of every horde of hell. But let me remind you, Sunday morning, all the more. Be here. Get here early. Just get up a little extra early if you need to. Set an alarm. I mean, if you have to drink some coffee or something to get you going, you know, better that. I'll, I'll tell you what. I'd rather have to take a little bit of coffee, be there in the meeting, ready to go, than to have no coffee because, I, you know, I don't know, maybe you think it's unhealthy to have coffee or something, and be just a deadhead. And not engaged. So let me remind you of that. I'm stirring up. I'm stirring a pot. Holy Spirit, stir us up, oh God, so we know the time and the hour we live in. So we not be deceived. So we not be the church that's sleeping that so many across this land are. But we don't be those engaged in a fight for the souls of men. For the souls of those who are innocent. They don't know any other way. Uh, the dear sisters that I know that my lovely wife brought today all they've known is religion and there's like so many people they know religion it was a miracle that they even came that's how much they've been turned off by religion like so many have but I tell you if you can be led by God and used by God to get people in here and there's a place where everybody's hooked up and maybe it's just a few for starters, but more than one or two that has the faith. Remember, the activation kind of faith. The activation kind of faith that Father is looking for. The realm of the impossible. The realm of the impossible. The realm that brings about the greatest miracle that ever happens, and that is salvation. 
So I just want to encourage you tonight in that. Remember that. Remember that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So just as a reminder, sometimes you got to say things a few times before, you know, maybe it's the, the sound in the back people can't hear or somebody fell asleep or something. But, but uh, you know, if you need to, I'm offering you a practical thing that you can do. Set a reminder in your calendar of whatever sort it is so that it reminds you, I will be engaged in the battle for men's souls. And I remind you of one other thing. The go out and compel them to come charge that has been going. I praise God for so many of you that have been doing that. You know, it doesn't matter if you go to 100 people or 1,000 people, just going for the one. Sooner or later, you're going to find the one. Again, many people have been burned by the stank that is religion. They've been burned. They've been seared because there's no life. It's just dead. It's the whitewashed tombs. Ha! It's the hypocrisy. That if I was them, if I was the world, I'd say, yeah, that stinks, man. That's nothing there. Remember Jesus just letting the Pharisees have it? About their religion, their practices, that they had all the forms. But they couldn't see God right there in front of them, the loving, merciful God. And it's so amazing. I don't know about you, but I just want to be like Jesus. I just want to be like my Savior. Just like, just like you, Jesus. Just like, just like you, Jesus. I want to be just like you, Jesus. And he's allowed us to be. Oh, just like, just like you, Jesus. Just like, just like you, Jesus. Just like, just like you, Jesus. Just like Jesus. And you know what? He was meek and he was lowly. You know, Matthew 11, I believe it's verse 28, where it talks about, uh, you know, come, <laughs> take, take my yoke, take my burden upon you, for it's light, it's easy. And, you know, he says, I'm meek and I'm lowly. He's, he was so humble. He was so gracious. You know, he wasn't some king that came riding in on the most muscled up stallion with the greatest troop of, I don't know, singers and entourage of people offering up the praises of his mighty majesty greatness, but how he came in on the colt, the little, the little uh, donkey baby. I mean, that's not a, the ex- best way to, but the, you know, the foal of a, of a donkey, a colt, a young little donkey, pretty puny. Can you imagine a puny little colt <laughs> that the king, the king who's going to gird his sword and ride prosperously, that's going to slay the armies of the evil one, who says to us, and I'll remind you that you always read this from now on, when he says, when the psalmist says, gird your sword upon, the th- on, upon your thigh, O Lord, and ride prosperously, he's telling us, Gird my sword upon your side and ride prosperously. Begin to step out. Begin to move out and watch what I do. Just watching. Slay the armies of the wicked as you go out to do the most greatest thing and purpose of life. And that is the ministry of the the life of Jesus Christ. To come and seek and save that which is lost. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we're going to continue reading here in a minute. But I'm just on build the altar. What does your altar look like? Is it rickety? Is it old? Was it built five years ago? Was it built ten years ago before the Lord? Are the stones falling off? Are they crumbling? Are there parts of it that just look like ruin? I wish I had a picture that I was imagining in my mind. Of a rickety altar where once the fire of God was allowed to fall. Because Remember, the fire will only fall in the perfect offering. He demands the perfect altar. He demands things done his way. Look at it throughout the way. If you didn't do it right, if you didn't put the altar just as it was, the fire would, would not come down. Let's look at the, let's, uh, Let me remind you of an example that confirms what I'm saying, right? So we got the, uh, Elijah in the great contest of whose God is God. And we got the prophets of Baal that build an altar. Maybe the exact same way. Probably the exact same way as Elijah. Oh, hear me. What does your altar look like? Does it look the exact same 
as those around you. But things aren't right. The heart isn't right. The motive isn't right. There's not the heart of truth. Would it be as the altars of Baal even? I know that's a radical concept. I'm not thinking of these things. This is just coming out. This is the way it works, praise God. But what a contrast for us to, to really just make bare our hearts before the Lord. So look at this. we got the exact same altar, right? <laughs> and the prophets of Baal do their whole thing. They're screaming. They're cutting themselves. They're doing everything they possibly can. They're giving, they're giving the most. I mean, come on, people. Aren't they just, aren't they going for it? Aren't they just giving everything? I mean, blood shedding, they're cutting themselves to make something happen. How many times do we uh, do things out of our own strength to make something happen? <laughs> what does your altar look like? First, you got to build it. Praise God. Build the altar. Build the altar. You see the altar several times, and I won't go into them, although I would love to. Each, each moment, you know, where Jacob builds the altar, where he had laid down, and he realized he was in God's midst, that he, he saw what we refer to a lot of times as the, <laughs> the kid's story, Jacob's Ladder, right? Where he saw heaven right there. And he builds an altar, and he says, God, I, he builds this altar, and he says, I'm going to honor you with a tenth. I'm going to honor you. And may we honor him with our life, with our giving. You know, and you know what? This is a, a side, but it's very much related. About the giving. About the giving. Where you say, Lord, you can have me. You can have my car. You can have my job. You can have my house. You can have my kids. You can have my living room. You can have my bedroom. You can have every part of me. Every part. Let everything vanish. Lord, if it needs be, let everything be taken out of the way. If, if, if it would cause me to take my heart off you so that the altar not be constructed or right, that it would be crumbling, maybe some stones missing. Some pieces. Maybe it's, maybe it's the artist in me a little bit, but I, I like visualizations. I mean, what does your altar look like? Does it look like the size of this flower pot? Or even imagine, you know, an eighth of this size, just a little something. Or does your altar look like the extravagant altar, if you could imagine, that was in the Holy of Holies that the Lord showed them to construct. That His fire would come down and consume the sacrifice. That His fire would come down. And I pray the song that was sung tonight of tie me to the altar be more than just words, but may it be something in anthem that resounds of tie me to the altar. Tie me to the altar. Contain and consume me in the flames of your love. Tie me tight to the altar, Lord, that I can't move, that I can't do my own way, that I not be distracted. Lord, but I be that living sacrifice that you purposed. So back to trying to wrap this up fairly quickly. The altar, then, then Elijah steps on the scene. The man of God. And he has to put all the water on it, right, to make it where it's impossible to show, again, the God of the impossible, the God of, who answers by fire, the God who answers by fire, the God of the impossible. Oh, you can do everything in the natural that says, no, there's no way this altar is going to be lit. But God comes through. God sends his fire, and it's like nothing. It's like the most easily ignited, dry kindling that there is. Oh, our God is a consuming fire. Oh, our God is a consuming fire. And may you with hearts wide open say, God, send your fire. 
as the words that Evan Roberts said in a prayer that really speaks to me of the positioning of the move of God that he was in, where he said, Lord, the wood is laid in order, the sacrifice prepared. Send your fire. There's a preparation. A right altar doesn't happen haphazardly. It doesn't happen by accident. It doesn't happen because you show up to church on Sunday morning. It doesn't happen even uh, as a more uh, extreme a case. You show up, you know, twice a month. Maybe you show up on Wednesday night. Oh, come on. I'm talking to some of you. <laughs> I know we got many of the faithful, but come on. Those hearts who say, what do you require of us, O oh God? Love righteousness. Do justice. Seek me and you will find me. Come out from among them and be separate. Don't be tainted with mixture of the world that would suffocate you. That would cause your altar to falter. That would cause your altar to be destroyed. And I say once again. When was the last time the fire of God came and consumed your altar? Came and consumed that sacrifice of praise that you offered up in worship. When was the last time where you felt the presence of God? You felt the fire of God come upon the altar, come upon you. That you felt a baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire. That we're not talking about just a religious expression, words, <laughs> but the fire of the almighty, all-consuming God. What if Nathaniel had been a hard man? What if Nathaniel had been a stubborn man? And when Jesus looked at him and said, Nathaniel, I saw you under the fig tree. But what did Jesus say? There is no false thing in him. There's nothing, there's truth in there. Yeah, he was like, well, yeah, right. I, I, this, how could that be that this, this guy is it? But the altar that's in order will be sensitive. That when the word of the Lord comes, you feel it leap in the inside. You feel a stirring of God because you're not clogged up with false pretense, with false humility, with false things. We're examining ourselves tonight. We're getting heavy. Most of you know I don't get heavy, usually. But this message was put upon my heart for you, those of you who are in this place. You're not here by accident, and you have one more chance, maybe just one more chance to hear the word of the Lord tonight, to get your altar right, because maybe your soul would be required for you tonight. Maybe this was your last night. Maybe this was your last worship service where you were able or had the chance to pour everything out of your being upon the king. Upon the king. And I know we don't get that a lot now because we don't really have kings in our parts. We have presidents who, and we all think we're so riot and kings of our own castles that we, we don't reverence and respect authorities like they used to, like a king. Can you imagine? The king was the guy. The king was your sovereign. He was the guy who made the rules that you live by. And there was a respect demanded upon you. But may we get that respect that God isn't just a pushover. He's not going to do it our way. He's not going to cooperate with the things that we say we are going to do for him. If they're not by his precept, if they're not by exactly what he ordered, there is an order to the altar. There is an order 
to the altar. The altar must be built. The wood must be ready and the sacrifice prepared. And the cry of send your fire, Lord, upon the altar. And I tell you, when the fire of God comes, the consuming fire, you will know. You will know there will be impact upon your life. If you have just but a little smoke, that's great, but that doesn't sound like to me the all-consuming fire of God. Praise God, there's something lit that can be burned. But let the consuming fire of God whoa, just so encompass and go. Can you imagine what that looked like? Can you imagine when we get to see what the fire of God looks like? It's, I've seen some pretty serious wildfires. We were back and lived right, right in Ramona when that, uh, I think it was 2007 or something like that. No, 2003, I think was the big one. Something like that. And uh, our house got just crisped. Well, our house didn't because we serve a God of the impossible that our propane tank didn't even go up despite the, it was hot. The, the propane tank should have gone up, but our, we serve a God of miracles. Who so cares about us that he keeps everything? He keeps everything. But I tell you, when that fire came through, it was like the moon. It was just ashes and blackness, and you could tell something happened. There was a change. It went from green, lush, and all these trees to just, wow, everything was consumed. Everything was consumed that the state of it was new. And may the altar be built that we, just the consuming fire of God come upon us. That nothing of us has remained. Nothing of the old has remained, but everything has been made new. What does your altar look like? What does your altar look like? What does your altar look like? Have you built an altar? Is your life an altar? Is your house an altar? For if we say we built the altar and we come in here as an altar, but we turn out and go out, and we don't live on the altar, if our house isn't the altar, if our purpose isn't the altar, if our life isn't the altar, then the altar has been altered. The altar is faltering. The altar is not perfect. I just hear Pastor Mark's Hebrew word, tamim. I don't speak Hebrew at all, but tamim, perfect. I know that one's what it means. Perfect. Perfect. Walk before me, Abraham, and be perfect. Be perfect. Abraham, a man who was before the undoing of power from on high, before Christ Jesus came, God looks at him and says, Abraham, be ye perfect. Noah, I find you perfect. Be ye perfect. Be ye holy, for I am holy. I am a zealous God. I am a God that is holy. I am a jealous God. He's a jealous God. Love. Praise God this isn't the case. But remember the story of Hosea and Gomer. Where Hosea marries that prostitute. And the love of God that's typified there of how he relentlessly pursued. I tell you what, just being real, if that was my wife and hit the road, I would be like, okay, yo, I, I, I'm not good enough, I'm moving on. But God's not like that in his love. He's not like that. It's a jealous love that burns, that always desires to pursue and win back. 
the affection of the heart, the affection and emotion on the inside and deepest parts. It's a jealous love. It's an unfailing love of relentless pursuit of you and I. It's a relentless, unwavering, unfailing love. And how could we be arrogant or prideful enough to reject that love and say, no, I could do this this way on Monday and come in on Sunday and be okay. (laughs) But the jealous God in his love, he pursues us. He runs after us. You know, he shows us in the, in, the, in the story of the prodigal son, the parable of the prodigal son that Jesus told us about. The son that goes out and he spends all the wealth of his father's house. Spends it all, comes to complete ruin. Eating with the pigs, gets totally just messed up. Totally consumed by the world. We must be those who go save those before they are consumed by sin. For the wages of sin is death. Let's go reap a harvest of people before the wages of sin has been able to ravage their soul. So they might be more more and more effective. I know that I serve a miracle God who can change and give life and rearrange everything. But let us seek people because we have the answer seek them before they get wasted by the world chewed up and spit out by everything from drugs we were just in washington it's legal marijuana is legal and watch out guys we get we get sensitized or desensitized to it oh you know it's legal let every man humanism sets in let everybody just do what they want to do when a drug it becomes a foothold of satan to eat at the very cool core of men's ways. More and more research is coming out. The people become antisocial. They become hateful. It messes you up. It messes you up. And people, again, the pleasures of sin, they have, there's a, the sin it has a pleasure for a season. But when we get so radical with it that we never again, just as this little example is going forth, to be desensitized to even things. We, we see it, we've seen it everywhere. I, Lord, have mercy. When I was in Santa Cruz, it was everywhere. But I'm sure many of you ha- have been around it. Don't, don't get desensitized to what that is. You know, I had to check myself the other day when Pastor Mark said that. I'm like, that's so true. That's destroying people. That's destroying people. It's given the devil a foothold to eat away this life of God. Hallelujah, and he's given us power and authority by his name to break every bondage of hell, every claim of the enemy. Oh, that we as the church arise, that we as the church arise and say, California, there's no way this election year that you're going to legalize that stuff. For I have none of it and it has none of me. And I serve the Almighty who's given me all power and authority to proclaim things and burn things. Bind them so and stop them. For the gates of hell cannot prevail against His church. And California is not done. Its day is not done. For the blood, sweat, and tears of many evangelists have been in this place. There is a great heritage in this place. And although... The enemy of our souls would try to lay claim through places like Los Angeles and Hollywood. God still has a heritage here. And we are the people of God are going to go forth, go forth as the altars built by God, not by us, by God. Because if they're built by us, I'm afraid that sounds too much like me of the strivings and cuttings of these worshipers of Baal. (laughs) 
And I love that Elijah just mocks him. He mocks him. <laughs> hey, maybe, you're, maybe your God's taking a little trip. Maybe you need to scream louder. <laughs> maybe you need to lift up your voice more. I tell you, the God who answers by fire, he hears everything. And if there's the whispers of truth in you that says, God, I want the altar to build to be built at a right, a perfect sacrifice here. And there is truth and there is acting where it's more than just words, but there is action. He comes in. But there are those <laughs> who lift up the desperate cry. They lift up the desperate cry. And I know the Lord takes pleasure in the cry. The shout, the shout. Oh, build your altar here, O oh God. Build your altar here, O oh Lord. Build your altar. Consume everything about me. Consume me with your consuming fire, O oh God. Contain and consume me. Contain and consume me. We only want you and we only want your fire and we only want your glory. The cloud of your glory. The pillar of fire and the cloud of glory. The glory of God and the fire of the Holy Ghost. Those, those types and shadows that show us in the new covenant of the fire of the Holy Ghost and the cloud of glory that surrounds us. Oh, the presence of God that is such a privilege that we can live every day in the presence of God. It's one of the things I love when we do meetings every night, you know, when we have those meetings. And you're every day in it. The constant reminder, it grows you and be like, oh, yeah, I can have this every day. Every day, every day. Remember, God has charged you with this life. He's given you this life. And we make the choices of what our life looks like. What our job is. What our time is. What's the time that we spend doing things? God has given you and I a will and an ability to not be confined by a world system, but to rearrange our lives and to fully trust in the blessing of God. For it, in total trust in God, He will bless you. There is a blessing. There is a blessing where you rely solely upon the Lord. Again, I'm not saying you have to quit your job. As Pastor Mark said, you're going to be the same person if you quit your job. If you are, but maybe you should scale back your job. Maybe you should make sure your job doesn't keep you out of church. Maybe you should be sure, set the hours of your job. Cut back a little bit to where you can say and have, okay. I'm going to get up. I'm going to have a diet of the word of the Lord. I'm going to get up in the morning, and the first thing I'm going to do is open up the Word. I'm going to eat, eat this good Word, the, the bread, the manna of heaven, so that I'd be full, that when I go to the job, I'm built up to be an evangel flame for the Lord, that, that I can minister. You know, a lot of times it's not about what we say. Of course, what we say is important, and that actually is very important, especially by your confession, people around, you know, and this all makes sense. But somebody who's full of life and happy and not got the Monday blues at their job is going to be, people are going to see that and they're going to say, what's different about you? They may say, man, you got a great disposition. Man, you're, wow. And then you could say, Christ Jesus saved me. Christ Jesus redeemed me. Christ Jesus gave me the abundant life. And he'll give it to you. Ha 
praise God, this is Genesis 12 being expounded by the Holy Ghost. Of the altar and of the calling out of God. Where he says, the Lord, the Lord, the God of all. The, the God who made Abraham, the God who made the ends of the earth says unto Abraham, get out of your country and from your kindred and from your father's house unto a land that I will show you. What if Abraham didn't listen to the call? What if you and I don't listen to the call where God says, come out? Come on, I'm going to take, there's better things for you. i got a plan, says the Lord. i got plans to prosper you. i got plans to give you hope. i got you plans to give you a future, to give you the best life ever possible. All you got to do is trust me and seek me and have things action. I'm afraid too many of us in the church have been contaminated by religion where we come in on Sunday and say, Lord, your way, and we go out and we have our way. And maybe we even say Yahweh. <laughs> when Jesus came to that fig tree, it was out of season, right? <laughs> when Jesus came and required fruit of the fig tree, it was out of season. Don't be out of season. I'm just in this time where I'm just trying to get things together. Oh, man, just, just trying to... Trying to go after this, trying to go after that. I see this a springboard for this, a springboard for that. So it's made me in off season. Be in season. Be in season because, again, we never know when the Lord's going to require fruit of us. And he's always looking for the fruit. He wants to bring forth fruit that remains, right? The John 15. Bring forth the fruit. Bring forth the fruit. Where is the fruit? If the tree is good, the fruit will be good. If the tree is evil, the fruit will be evil. What is the fruit? Come on, let's not get religious about it and the religiosity that so many living in the church. Oh, yes, I have the fruit. I have the fruit, the fruit. What, the fruit is what we can see. Where's the action? Where's the, what, what is the measure of our life? And when we're real and we say, what is the fruit? And we examine, examine, examine. <laughs> Examine. We don't need the Holy Ghost Himself to just, uh, you know, appear to us and tell us exactly what the fruit. We can take account, just like we can take an account of any di dimension of our life. Just as we could, you know, count up possessions or things that we have, or take take number of of workers or teams that we have. Take account. What is the account? What is the account? And I want that to resonate with what is the altar? What does the altar look like? What does the altar look like? Is there a chance that the altar would be faltering by the conduct of Monday through Friday? Or the altar prepared on Sunday and then it's neglected the rest of the week? right? The altar. Build the altar. Build the altar. Build the altar. Build the altar. Let everything about our life be the altar. The altar. The altar. Our homes, the altar. Our lives, the altar. The altar. The perfect altar. And praise God, if you haven't had the altar, your altar has been faltered. That you can call upon the name of the Lord and He'll wash you clean. He'll give you a new start, a new day. He'll build the altar. But there's a requirement of us in the action. In the action to line up to the Word. To line up. Everything about our lives according to the Word of God. To be unspotted from the world. To not be contaminated by the world. For every sacrifice typified had to be perfect. From the lamb that was slain. Every lamb that was slain each year. 
all the way up to Jesus Christ, the perfect sacrifice. It had to be perfect. It had to be perfect. And don't be contaminated by those who would say we don't have to be perfect. For the call, Father has called us to be perfect. He says, be holy for I am holy. He looks for the perfect. And I tell you, if you have that true heart, he will make you perfect. He will perfect everything that concerns you. It's the gospel. It's the good news. It's amazing to me. It even happened this last week. When people get upset when they hear the message that Christ Jesus came to set us free from every bondage, from every slave, that we don't have to be slaves to sin. It's like, how can you be so messed up, man? Freedom. True freedom. 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 That makes me excited. Freedom. <laughs> but people have allowed themselves to be contaminated by the world and marked by sin that has its wage, that compromises them and makes them hard. The hardness of the heart, the deceitfulness of sin that makes them. As we will see one day, it'll be such that the, the God, the judge of all, will be seen by people and they will say, let the rocks fall upon us for we don't want to see this God. We don't want anything to do with that. That is just so radical rebellion. And I tell you, if there's one thing in my life that scares me the most. It's rebellion. It's rebellion. And I pray that it, may, it, just, it just break you. There is a breaking and a humility before God that he requires of us every day. And it's the pride of life that brings about a rebellion. And I have zero tolerance for a rebellion. I tell you, if any of you, I would encourage you, if you have a problem with rebellion, if rebellion is something that has a grasp, fast. Fast. I'd rather go out without food and realize how needy I am for God. For when you fast, especially for several days, your perspective on everything changes. You become so humble. You become so... Things that didn't stand out to you before, I'm telling you from experience, the people around you it's like, you, wow, how can I serve this person? Wow, you become in touch. So I, I just want to encourage, maybe that's for some of you guys here. If anybody's feeling callous or you've had to deal with the spirit of rebellion, would you not honor God enough to just say, I'm not going to take any bread, God. I'm not going to take any sustenance into me until everything in my spirit. Now, it's not the works, right? It's not the works like we have to, have to fast. But God sees a desperation. God sees a desperation. As Pastor Mark ministered School of the Spirit a, a couple nights ago, it might have been the last time, how Jesus told us the disciple is not above his master. And how he's encouraging us that we are not above Jesus. Look what Jesus did. Jesus, he fasted, he prayed, he always said, I only do what the Father tells me to do. I only do what God tells me to do. That needy, that humbleness, I'm meek and lowly. As Isaiah 66 says, Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. But I will come and dwell with you. That are broken and contrite. That humility. The Lord loves humility. The Lord loves humility. So I'm going to say that one more time. Because rebellion runs rampant in this age. Rebellion runs rampant in the church. The spirit and haughtiness of pride, it's just gross, man. It's gross. For there is a humility, but also a confidence and a boldness. Where the Lord grants his service, servants boldness. Even as in Acts they prayed, grant your servants boldness where we can have this total humility and total reliance upon God, but yet we are bold. The uncompromisingly righteous are bold as a lion. The uncompromisingly righteous. 
What does uncompromisingly mean? What does uncompromise? It means no compromise, right? No compromise. The righteous. The righteous. The righteous. The blessing to the righteous. The blessing to the saints. What does your altar look like? What does the altar of our lives, every one of us, from the smallest child to the eldest one, What does our life look like? I'm going to read verse 1 again. Now the Lord said unto Abraham, Get you out of your country from your kindred and from the, your father's house. Unto a land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and I will make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curses you. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And the promise that the Father gave to Abraham, he's given to us. That in blessing he will bless us. And that all the families of the earth can be blessed, that we can go and seek and save that which is lost, to, to bring people into the blessing of God, into the household of faith. So Abraham departed. He moved upon God's word. Again, he had a choice. The word of the Lord came to him, and he had to act. Didn't get all the details. He was called out. He was called by God. We are called by God, and many times we don't know the details of what all that is. But we must seek him, just as Abraham and Hebrews 11 says that Abraham, he, he sought a city whose builder and maker was God. Abraham, it was counted unto him for righteousness because he believed God, because he trusted God. Verse 4, so Abraham departed the action. As the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abraham was 70 and 5 years old, and he departed out of Haran. More than likely, he was pretty set in his ways, right? 75 years being somewhere, you get a routine. You get something comfortable, right? <laughs> so many times, God calls us out of the comfortable. He calls us out of the comforts. He calls us out of maybe what to us seems like the good place, like everything's ordered, everything is working. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. We've all heard that before, right? He calls us out. And we must take the action even as Abraham departed. He left. He, said, he followed God. He counted God faithful. May we count God faithful. May we count God faithful. Not just by saying, God, I count you faithful. But by the action saying, God, I count you faithful. Here it is. Here it is, Lord. Wherever you lead me, wherever you lead me, wherever you lead me. God, I know my family is nothing. God, I know my family cannot come to anything or be right without you. Unless I give over. Unless I give over. Unless I surrender. And may all of us grab it now before our kids get too old. For the younger they are, the easier they are influenced. And we give account as fathers. We give an account as mothers, but especially fathers. It's on us fathers. We see later on here, I think it's two chapters away, that God says, Abraham, I know you'll command your house. We give account fathers. Will we allow our children? Are we in the house of God when it's there? Do we go up to the sanctuary just like they did in the Song of Degrees? As they ascended the ascension psalms, they went up by families. The father, the priest of the home. Fathers. Fathers. And I hear this from the Spirit of the Lord speaking right to me. Fathers. Fathers. Be like your father in heaven. Show your family. Lead your family.
Fathers, pray for your family. Fathers, intercede for your family. Fathers. Be fathers. It's never too late. It's never too late. It's harder. It's harder. But it's never too late. Because we serve the God of the impossible. Let the altar be built. Let the wood be prepared. The sacrifice ready. Father's model for your children. Fathers, as it was commanded, the fathers in the books of the law even, you know, the, to bind the statutes, have them all at the frontlets before your eyes. And how Joshua says in Joshua 24, 15, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I just got to say this one more time because I'm on it. I'm on it. I'm on something in the spirit. Fathers, we give account for our children. We give account for our wives. We can't blame anybody else but ourselves. And I've heard recently just the call of the Father to just such divine order. And if you don't know how to pray, you can pray this prayer that the Lord has been causing me to pray, and that is, I want everything in my family to be in divine order. Lord, I want everything in my family to be in divine order. For our families are the most important things. If we lose our family, it's a key, and I, I know that maybe some of you can't even understand the depths of this, but you've been, if you've been around or know of people who plundered hell, Many souls saved, and they lost their family. And you, you've seen, or I've seen, it, it, it's just so, it busts you, man. It busts you. It breaks you. It's the most important thing to you. Some of you may not know it yet because you don't have children, but you know it a little bit because you can imagine your mom, your dad, your brothers and sisters. But imagine losing them just as you would lose them if they died. It's that intense. It's that much of a breaking. But it's never too late. It's never too late. For we must model for our children, and I'm on it just a minute more, about no compromise and complete surrender to God to keep us. And boy, have I been blessed to have Pastor Mark as my father and pastor. But I've been blessed because I never allowed the spirit of the world of rebellion to in any way affect me. It tried. Believe me, it tried. It comes out of each one of us, and we make the choice. Because Satan is the master deceiver. He'll make you think that you're right and you're justified to be in your rebellious, stinking self. But always fall on the rock and be crushed. That you might be fit for the master's use. Hallelujah. That's for somebody in this place tonight. I know it. I feel it. I know when heaven speaks. And it's important for all of us who are sold out completely to remember. We need to be fathers. Fathers, we need to be fathers. We're in a time of great deception. We're in a time where in the course of this world there's been a flood of iniquity. That we as fathers must make the choices from the things we watch to the things we allow on our computers to every area. Every area for every man knows what I'm talking about. You must be tried in this area. You must be tried. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. 
will try to get in there and take root. And to many, it has, and it's been compromised. But I praise God for those of you youth, Mr. David Graham and the Caleb's, who said, God, I want you more than anything else. I'll give up anything. I'll give up my technology eases just to have you. I'll throw this into the wall. I'll stomp on it. I'll chop it with an axe if it needs to because I am that serious. And that's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. And watch as the Lord just keeps taking you guys deeper and deeper. And he'll make you a voice among these youth. Oh, I begin to prophesy. You'll be leaders to those around you. You'll be leaders to be able to pluck people out of the grip of hell. That gross, demonic grip that has so many lives seized. But praise God, he's raising up men that will be men. That will be valiant for the Lord. I'm speaking to the fathers, and I have been for them, and I'm speaking to those who would be fathers. For what we sow now, we will reap. I'm telling you. I'm getting in the youth message. Guys, my heart's always been for the youth. And it, it, I bleed it. It flows through my veins. My goal is to be as radical as Pastor Ruth. She's radical. But there is a heritage, you guys. I just want to encourage each one of you, each man in here. Whether you're a father now or you will, more than likely you're going to be. Unless you feel the call like the Apostle Paul that says, God, I just want you so much, I don't want any distractions. For is there, there is that place of love, and Jesus told us about that. For those who can bear it. But that we can be godly men. Godly men to model for our children. To raise up the valiant. It's a time for us to be valiant. Men, it's a time for us to be valiant. Women, it's a time for us to be valiant. Huh. Those, those who do great exploits. Thank you, Father. Lord, you're so amazing. So amazing. He's so amazing that he just, he speaks through us. It, it's just so amazing. <laughs> Some people just have to learn how to shut off their mind. But I'm so thankful. He's, he just uses us. He uses your mouth. It's just, again, it's that action. It's the altar. It's the altar. It's the sacrifice. Oh, the Holy Ghost is moving. The Holy Ghost is brewed in here. Yula maya do kashala. Yimaya la vasheku. Umaya la yeyo. Yinaya aneesu. Umaya sumaya. Umaya sumaya. I just got to take a praise break for a moment. Umaya la yeyo. Umaya la yeyo. God, you whose ways are higher than our ways, but who's given us the way that we can walk in those ways. Before you had to say, your ways are not my ways and your thoughts are not my thoughts. But now he says, he gives us the ability for our ways to be just like, just like, just like you, Jesus. Just like, just like you, Jesus. Just like, just like you, Father. Just like, just like you, Father. Just like Jesus. <laughs> to many, it's an amazing revelation. It should be to us as well. But that we can be just like Jesus. It's a gift, the gift of righteousness. It's called the gift of holiness. It's called the gift of righteousness for a reason. It's so beautiful, so beautiful. And you can't, you can't say these things enough. For anybody who was thinking they heard this before, <laughs> are you living it? Are you living it? Lord, way it may, we live it. Lord, we resolve no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delights, things that are higher, things that are nobler. These have caught our sight. Do 
You hear it in all those revival songs. A truth that says, I have seen something. I have seen something that I want. To take my wheels and make it thine, it shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own, for it shall be your royal throne. <laughs> Jesus, you're so good. God is so amazing. And I don't say that religiously. God is so awesome. We serve an awesome God. We serve an awesome God. Verse 6, and Abraham passed through the land of the place of Sychem. You're going to pass through some stuff. You're going to pass through some stuff. There's going to be an evidence that you're moving. You're going to be challenged by some things. You may at times be as Abraham and have to go rescue some of your family for some federation of kings, some forces of hell that are set up to get them. But praise God. Ha! He makes us valiant. I mean, look at, can you imagine what Abraham's force was? It probably wasn't that big, right? What was it, like seven, was it five or seven uh, confederacies? Sorry, guys, I'm not sure off the top of my head. But it was a large number there. I think it was five or seven um, of, of kings. So it was at least a couple kings joined together, forces. They go to raid Lot, right, the family. Abraham's family, who he brought, right? God didn't appear to, to Lot and say, come follow me. He appeared to Abraham. And Lot was willing enough to follow his uncle, <laughs> the family. Oh, Lord, our families. Lord, our families, may we grab a hold of them. May we, may we be used by you just as Abraham was to go down into that confederacy and just wipe them out, to just chop them up, chop suey, just chopped up, just crush them to be able to save Lot. And Lot got himself in trouble again. We see that. He goes and dwells in Sodom, right? He gets, he gets, uh, he's vexed, right? But he, he gets, uh, he gets hardened just like if we allow compromise. Sin will harden your heart. You won't be sensitive. But praise God for righteous Abraham who was able to grab his family. And the Lord who is just so amazing showed up to Abraham and tells him, you know, after, I know I'm going over some chapters here, but, you know, when, when God appears to Abraham and Abraham says, hey, I want to make you something. I want to make you a meal. I want to wash your feet. Just hang out here for a minute, and God does. How cool is that? God stays with them. And then God tells him, shall not the, or Abraham, we get the whole thing that God says, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm, what I'm doing, the reason that I'm here? All the way to where Abraham says, in that relationship and, and a, a humility and such a reverence, shall not the, the judge of all the earth do what's right? There was no rebellion in that. There was, there was a, a pleading. There was an intercession for people. There was an intercession for the family. And we get all the way, we see the rescuing. He's so amazing. Because we're going to see here in verse 8 about an altar being built. So we've got, I've talked to you about a passing. You're going to pass through some things. But remember, one of the promises is, no matter what you go through, you pass through the water. It shall not drown you. Pass through the fire. It shall not, it shall not kindle upon you. Neither shall the floods drown you. You may pass through some stuff. But praise God, it's showing you're moving somewhere. You're moving somewhere. We're in motion. Praise God, something's moving in the life. And on the plain of Mora, or Moray. And the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abraham and said, Unto your seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. He built the altar. And he removed from there unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent. Having Bethel on the west and Haon on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name. He built the altar and called on the name of the Lord. Oh, Jesus. How 
Have you built the altar? Have you built the altar? What does your altar look like? Was it an altar that perhaps you got all fired and into God because you got scared of some Y2K thing at the turn of 1999 to 2000? You were like, okay, I'm ready. If something bad might happen, so I'm going to get things right. And maybe it was 16 years ago, the new millennium. Oh, wow, I better get things right because something's the big year. Year 2000 only happens once. Uh, who knows? There's some rumblings, but... What did your 2000 look like? The year 2000. Flashback to year 2000. And all that God had us doing in San Diego. San Diego. I have images come to mind of the men who God who started coming here. You know, it was before that. I was touched by many meetings in the 90s. But remember what we were doing in 2000. on that Naval Training Center. And it was actually a little bit of time before that, but it, 2000 was a part of it as well. What did your life look like? Maybe some of you were a lot smaller then. I know I was. But what did the touch of God do to you? What has the touch of God done to you? For many, it's just been a flaky shake. It's been a just fill me up so I, then I can feel good about myself. And this is a message that, praise God, that the Lord has a servant by the name of Pastor Mark who's going through and rallying the church and just telling him, look, guys, yo, the king ain't got no clothes on. <laughs> that, yo, hey, we're not just here to be feel that feeling good about ourselves. Get a shake, a rattle, and a roll, but it's for something. Right? So I'm going to say it one more time, just in, 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 in this building the altar vein, about the fruit, examine the fruit. What did, what did 2000 look like? What did the fruits of the 2000, a year in your life, what did your tongues look like? What did your prayer look like? What did your passion look like? To 2016, to right now, on this day of the Lord in August, 2016, this Lord's Day, where every day should be the Lord's Day, but praise God, at least some have a commitment to calling Still reverencing the Sabbath, the, the Sunday, the day of the Lord, the, the day of rest. What's the fruit? What's the fruit? You know, it's one of those things, if you don't have a motivation for an action, you won't do it. We see these Olympic athletes right now, since it is the Olympics, who gave, some of them gave their whole, whole lives, hours and hours to, you know, jumping over some sticks <laughs> to be the fastest, to be able to lay claim, I'm the fastest person in the world. I'm the best in the world at jumping over some, for some sticks or at swimming in a giant bathtub. I'm the fastest. I could do that the fastest. And they spent so much time and so much effort. And their motivation was the prize that they would earn. And remember, the Apostle Paul tells us, we run a race for a prize. We run a race for a prize. And remember, examine ourselves again the altar what are we pursuing? What's the threshold that we mark for ourselves of something that we give our whole heart to achieve? 
Maybe it's hours and hours of school. Maybe it's hours and hours of practice on instruments. Maybe it's hours and hours in sports. And Miss Jacqueline, the other day, posted something by C.T. Studd. Man who many know from the saying, we have only one life and it soon will pass and only what's done for Christ will last. That talked about the, the energy, to paraphrase, it's a great quote, you can look it up. Just ask Jacqueline what the book or the quote is. But, you know what, I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna read it real quick because it, it's powerful. Here's a man of God. He says, we Christians today are indeed a tepid crew. <laughs> How do we but half the fire and enthusiasm of suffragettes of the past, we would have had the world evangelized. How do we the pluck and heroism of the men who had, would go on polar expeditions or climb Everest, or for any ordinary daredevil enterprise. Come on, I know some of you guys are daredevils. You guys will do some stuff. I know Miles, I've seen him do some stuff that I'd be scared to do. It's like acrobatics, ninja warrior or something. But just to do, uh, to do some of these things, and a, and a, a daredevil tenacity, as T. Stud says here. We could have every soul on earth knowing the name of Jesus Christ in less than 10 years. Come on, C.T. Come on. Bring it down right to where we are. Thank you, Jacqueline, for posting this the other day. I, let me encourage you guys, again, of the power of your testimony. And what's so amazing, we do live in a day of this, all this social media where before you had to go out and sash, so, sashalize, socialize, um, but we can do so through our media. And how many are our friends that are unsaved, when you share stuff like this, or you share scripture, instead of, you know, the, the latest fitness program or uh, vitamin or <laughs> mineral that's changed your life forever. But you, you, and I mean that stuff that's good, it, it can be good. Sometimes it's just a snare. If it's, if it's really to uh, keep you going to do more in the kingdom instead of be uh, just a, a wretched weight. Wretched weight. I say that exactly as the Spirit of the Lord would describe it. It's a wretched, it's a wretched weight. It's a wretched weight. But how we can use our social media to propagate the gospel. And maybe some of you are, who are like me that were, you know, you're not really on Facebook a lot. You're not, you're not really doing that thing. But you can hear the call like, hey, I can, I can make some time to do something that's word of God that's going to be impacted, you know. And don't listen to the lies of people that, that, that say, oh, you know, everybody already has their opinions established and just to post something on there is just creating. People are always determined. No, the Word of God is living. An encounter with Jesus. Some people, the only Word of God they'll ever have is your life. Maybe what you post on Facebook. Huh. <laughs> It's amazing. So thank you, those of you who are already doing that. I know I got to do that more. Here comes this next part. You ready? To your knees, man, and to your Bible. Decide at once. Don't hedge. Time flies. Cease from your insults to God. And we can grab a hold of it. It's insulting. It's insulting not to spend time with God. It's insulting to go after your job more than God. It's insulting to go after some knowledge more than God. It's insulting. <laughs> it's insulting. If I was spending some time over here instead of with my wife and just leaving her like last measures, eek, that wouldn't be very good. Don't insult God. I feel like I'm starting to sound like Pastor Ruth. Don't insult God. Don't insult, insult God with your selfish self. Oh, I feel the anointing of Pastor Ruth coming on. Don't insult God with your selfish self. Get out of your selfish self. And into a selflessness. A life that denies itself as Jesus told us to. 
Get out of your selfless self. Ha. Thank you, Pastor Ruth, for the woman of God you are. I don't know where you are. You're somewhere around here. Don't hedge time flies. Cease your insults to God. Quit consulting flesh and blood. Stop your lame lying and cowardly excuses. Isn't that so true? Come on. Doesn't that stir somebody up? I saw that the other day. I'm like, yeah, that, wow. Praise God for truth. Calling it like it is. Calling us out to your knees, man, and to your Bible. Practical things build the altar. Practical thing number one. Do you have a good diet of the Word? Are you in the Word every day? Maybe some of you youthies, actually the youth in here already got this set, but let me talk to the youth so I can talk to you without making you offended or want to move out or pack your bags. We had some people say that. I was ready, I was ready to pass, pack my bags when Pastor Mark started talking about we could live the life of Christ. It's like, what? <laughs> what? That is so far from what God has. Ugh. Do you even, it comes down to, do people even have a heart for God? Do they have a hunger for God? Because that shows, that reveals that demon thing. That shows how much of the world is in them, how much they've been compromised. But praise God, he's got his messengers like Pastor Mark going through the church to wake the church up to the reality of Christ where if they just read the Bible, things would come to the light. They would see. Bear with me a couple more minutes, guys. Bear with me a couple more minutes. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Time flies. It's true. Cease your insults to God. Cease your insults. Are we in the Word every day? Are we in prayer every day? I know many of you are. I know many of you are. But there's some of you who aren't. And your spirit, man, is as weak as the weakest weakling. Come on. Your spirit, man's weak. <laughs> I'm provoking you to good works here. I believe those men of Raven Hill the same. Have we no spiritual stature? Have we no spiritual stature? But praise God, he's got people in this place that are raising up soldiers that know how to endure hardness. That aren't wimps. Another little aside here. This blessed me the other day. Pastor Daniel uh, was sharing with me what the Message Bible says about Nahum 3. Verse 13. And I usually don't lead, read the Message Bible. I know our dear brother Pat Schatzlein does. And I'm just going to pull it up here because I don't want to mangle it. But it's, it's pretty good. It, it, it's sometimes... When you hear something a little different... Slightly different, it shocks you, right? It's like, it brings it in a fresh light. So bear with me as I'm trying to pull up the Message Bible here. In Nahum chapter 3, verse 13. Still speaking about building the altar. Here we go, I'm almost there, pulling it up. Nahum 3, 13. <laughs> watch, watch what he says here. It, it sounds a lot like what C.T. Studd was saying by the Spirit of God. He says, face it. Your warriors are wimps. Your warriors are wimps. You're sitting ducks. <laughs> your borders are gaping doors inviting your enemies in. And who's to stop them? Again, another thing. Where's the spiritual stature? Where's the altar? When we evaluate. <laughs> I 
Would we be found the wimps, the warriors that are the wimps, the weaklings? Oh, God forbid. God forbid. Give us spiritual stature, God. But you know, just as these, uh, I like to just use this example because the Olympics are going on right now. Just as these ap- athletes are made strong through, through doing, doing their exercises again and again. We become strong and we become mighty in the word and, and giving ourselves to desiring the spiritual, giving ourselves to the word, giving ourselves to prayer. For he makes our spirit mighty. Hallelujah. And so many, I'm going to say this, uh, and lastly in, in wrapping up, so many, this is their state in the church. They are wimps and they're sitting ducks to the devices of the enemy. And many of them, they, they don't like the message that we can be free from sin and live like Christ Jesus. When my heart and our heart should be, wow, I just want to be like you, Master. I just want to be that disciple that's just like his Master. I can't be above my Master, but I can be just like my Master. I can be just like you, Jesus. I can be just like you, Jesus. I can be just like you, Jesus. If you leave out of this place tonight with nothing else in this, try to remember this prayer. But I know the Holy Ghost can do more than that for the hungry. But if you have nothing else to begin, it's just say, I want to be just like you, Jesus. Teach me how to be just like you, Jesus. For he feels the hungry. He feels the hungry. He feels the thirsty. He'll not give. A stone to a person that asks bread. Some bad thing like a scorpion. Oh, but it is his good will to give us of the kingdom. The kingdom. Stand with me, saints. Stand with me, saints. No, I don't think you heard me. Stand with me. Stand with me. Stand with me. Hear the Spirit of the Lord saying, stand with me. 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 We will stand with you, O Lord. We will stand with you, O Lord. We will be uncompromisingly righteous. Many of you, you finally find yourself in a state of saying, oh, I just want to be bold. That's good, but you know what? Move out in faith. He will make you bold for... Remember the promise. The uncompromisingly righteous are bold as lions. All you have to do is say, grant unto your servant's boldness and know that he's given it. And you can begin to reach out. You can begin to move out. And he will feel just like the simple things of sharing your testimony. He will feel it. Not a religious thing. But as you become sensitive to moving and speaking by the Spirit of God. And be dedicated with, with it. Some people it takes longer. Some people have gotten more used to relying on themselves as good order, orators and good talkers. They can talk to a, a fan and make it move. I don't know. Just as an example of how well somebody could speak. Their words are like honey. <laughs> anyway. Uh, but to speak by heaven, to speak by the Holy Ghost. That's what I resign myself to, and I pray you do too. But again, it grows by us stepping out. Many of you, you don't have the opportunity right now to stand up and minister. But there's a place where you have, many of you, that I've seen you going out. Brother Raphael and Aaron were sharing me the other, with me the other day how them and Mato say they were taking up the call that went out and going to seek people and just encounters from those that uh, some were obnoxious. One guy, uh, Matos got so radical, he stood behind the guy's car. The guy's saying, I'm going to call the cops. I'm going to call the cops. I want to I hear. Matos is like, hey, you need to hear this. All I'm trying to do, it, it was amazing. I want that. Oh, I mean, look at that. That's an example in the house of the resolve. The Holy Ghost resolve that says, Matos was able to hear by the Spirit. I want that person. I want you to go. Now, it's up to them what they do with it, right? You're going to encounter some people that uh, may be resist. But guess what? We have all authority in heaven to, to, to cast that demonic thing out. To say, ears open, eyes see, go free in Jesus' name. 
So uh, just one little story I wanted to share that I know many of people are going out and doing that. And that's so good. I mean, for many of you, that's where, it's where all of us are supposed to be. For many of you, that is your place right now where you'll allow the Spirit to speak through you and you'll get sensitive to speaking. We have our prayer where we begin to speak and pray by the Spirit. And that's what is first and foremost before we go out. But as we go out and, the, and God sees our hunger and our thirst and just our, where we want our words to just be so heaven and life changing that he comes and sees somebody that he can use. So thank you again everybody that has been going out. Continue to go out. Remember, set, set, a, set an alarm, set a th reminder on your calendar, whatever works for you to remember about what your place is. Maybe for some of you it's as bad as you got to be reminded just to, to show up and be happy and, and be not a false witness. Those of you it's going to be a bit more. It's going to be, it's the time to go and get people, to pick them up, to go out. And that's for many of us, most of us in here. Actually, I don't, no one's excluded from that. Not giving anyone any excuses. No excuses. Right, youth? No excuses. But activated because you never know what the Sunday is going to be, and it'll be every Sunday. I tell you, it's going to be every Sunday. You're responsible for every Sunday. But a Sunday like this, where people come in that have known nothing but religion, that need to see a church, that need to see the Pentecostal, Baptism of the Holy Ghost. Operation of the Spirit. Life-changing miracle of heaven healing. And remember with that, the most important time is the altar time. As many of you guys that can be praying with us, as many of you guys that can, just be hooked up, hooked up in prayer. We know those times in here where we all have been hooked up in prayer and the things that God does. But again, the rallying cry of heaven to gather us all up and to the oneness that we're supposed to be flowing in, that no man be turned to his own way ever, and especially on Sunday morning. Hallelujah. Praise God. Just begin to thank the Lord for what He's doing in you. Begin to thank Him for the altar. Begin to thank Him for the altar. Begin to consecrate the altar. Some of you need to re-consecrate the altar. Some of you, your altar is faltered. Some of you, you got stones falling off and the last time the fire of God came there is I don't know when. There's no trace of coals. How many of you know when a fire happens? For a little while after, there's a trace that you can find the fire. There's some heat there. Even when the coals go white and look like they're there, you can still get burned. You can still get burned. Come on, I'm stirring you up. Stirring me up. Lord, we consecrate the altar. We consecrate our lives at an altar. Lord, every person in this place I bring before you. In your mercy, God. In your mercy, God. In your mercy, God. In your mercy, Lord, send your fire. Lord, may the importance of the altar be at the forefront of our mind. That the fathers in this place will be fathers. That the leaders in this place will be leaders. That we'll be most of all raised up to be just like you, Jesus. And a desire to live a life in such consecration and holiness and purity and virtue before you, God. Altars built aright. Altars so perfectly ordered that you send your fire. That you send your fire. Send your fire. Send your fire here, oh Lord. Oh, the wood is laid in order. 
the sacrifice prepare sin your fire oh the wood is laid in order the sacrifice prepare sin your fire oh the wood is laid in order the sacrifice prepared for sin your fire upon this altar the wood is laid in order the sacrifice prepared for sin your fire your holy ghost fire holy ghost fire oh we desire your holy ghost fire Holy Ghost fire, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost fire. Holy Ghost fire. Oh, Holy Ghost fire, Holy Ghost fire. Oh, the wood is laid in order, the sacrifice prepared, send your fire. Oh, the wood is laid in order, the sacrifice prepared, send your fire. For you alone we desire God. You alone our hearts desire you, you alone, oh God. We will not mix it up, 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 oh God. No mixture, no compromise. Oh, for the wood is laid in order, the sacrifice prepared here. For you to send your all, send your fire, God, upon this altar. Oh, the wood is laid in order. The sacrifice prepared. Send your fire. I feel prompted for two things. One, if there's anybody, as the word of the Lord went forth about fathers being fathers. I'm going to pray for you. The second thing is... If you examine your life and you look at your altar and you say, whoa, my altar is faltered. There's not the flame. There's not the fire. There's not the fire of God that he requires. But I'm afraid it either went completely out or I became lukewarm. I want to pray for you tonight. The rest of you, keep praying with us. Keep pressing in tell you sometimes all it takes is just an answer father so many people forget that the church isn't about man this church isn't about a man but a spirit I pray that we grow to know even more as we are commanded to not each other not after the flesh but after the spirit that none of us ever Resent spiritual authorities. You know what I'm going to do? I want everybody to come up here, please. Everybody just come up. I feel to do this. Everybody just come up. We're just going to, as a collective body here, begin to wait on the Lord, begin to consecrate, begin to let the, the cry of the consecration, the cry of the consecrate. Be heard. And God's going to do something amazing. God's going to do something amazing. You're going to find the altar in your secret place and new dimensions of this grace of God. You're going to find strength 
you're going to find newfound strength. You're going to find miracles just happening as you begin to move, as you begin to act out this word, as you begin to live out the word, as you begin to submit yourself to God, as you begin to cry out in desperation and consecration to the Lord. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you move upon every person in this place. I grab every person in this place and present them for you, God. I present them before you, God. I present them before you, Lord. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for your keeping power. You see every heart and every heart that is hungry, God, you invade right now. Right now, right now, right now, right now, right now. Right now, right now, right now. The glory of heaven. The glory of heaven invading every soul. The glory of God, divine strength, supernatural joy, supernatural increase, supernatural growth, supernatural ability, strength that you never had to be able to run this race, to be able to be witnesses and do by power from on high. People that want to live just like Jesus and have resolved themselves to live just like Jesus. you Lord we love you Lord oh we just want to love you more we just want to love you more we want to pour out the offering God greater and deeper than we ever have before Lord that it be as precious ointment that we know how to go get precious ointment that we know how to find things that are dear to you oh because they're dear to us that they that they represent something that that represents even as the woman with the alabaster box something so precious that it was something that was saved up for a long time, something dear. But we pour out on you the things that are dear. We pour out on you a dear offering, a precious offering, God. A precious offering. The wood is laid in order. The sacrifice prepare, send you fire. Oh, the wood is laid in order. The sacrifice prepare, send your fire. Oh, I just want to thank you, those of you who know how to sing from your heart. They realize it's not, I'm not up here singing just to hear my voice. But I'm singing right to your spirit because the Lord has given me an ability to sing he's given me an ability just as he gave the psalmist to proclaim things the things inside of you can become alive at the mention of the word of the Lord through his ministers thank you Lord thank you Lord